So we could look at water. And if I'm concerned about the interaction, we're looking at a force. So I want to see how it interacts with another molecule. That purple dotted line, is that hydrogen bonding? Why not? Okay. I see a dipole on both sides. We've got a mismatch in our charge alignment. What's the partial charge on hydrogen? Partially positive. This one's partially positive. Positive, positive isn't going to work for us. Okay. So just because we see a compound that can potentially do hydrogen bonding doesn't mean there is hydrogen bonding in that arrangement. So a better way to orient it might be like this. And now what do we have? Okay, we've got the partial negative of the positive, that interaction. We have a dipole on the right-hand side. We have a dipole on the left-hand side. Now, do we have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine? Yep, so hydrogen bonding. Okay, why go through all that trouble? Well, let's try it again with another molecule. This time, and this time I'm going to simplify it. Let's just look at individual bond. Um, whoops, well, we're just going to do it this way anyway. Hydrogen bonding now or not? Why not? There's no dipole-dipole. For us to have a dipole-dipole force, what type of bond do we need? Polar covalent. To have a polar covalent bond, what do we have to have? Anything bound to halogen, oxygen, or nitrogen. Our right side definitely gives, gives us that dipole. Does our left side? No. No. We'd end up with a London dispersion force. No dipole, dipole. I don't care if there's a hydrogen bound oxygen. Completely irrelevant. Okay, so let's try it again. I'm going to erase both of them. Let's go with carbon, oxygen. Hydrogen bonding or not? That's a dipole. That's a dipole. And I have a hydrogen bound to oxygen. Look at your dipoles. Your carbon is positive. Your hydrogen is positive. Again, it's a mismatch of those partial charges. Everybody think you got it? Okay, well, Which is more electronegative, carbon or oxygen? The oxygen. Okay. You don't need to know the electronegativity, but you should remember the trend. Upper right-hand corner is the most electronegative. So if we look, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon is the next one on our periodic table. Carbon has to have a lower electronegativity than anything next to it. What do you think? Hydrogen bonding now? Hold your answer. Okay, what do you think? Hydrogen bonding? Yes. yes. We have that polar covalent bond generating the dipole on our carbon oxygen double bond. We have our polar covalent bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen, again, giving us our dipole. We have a dipole dipole. Within that interaction, do we have a hydrogen interacting? Uh, with an electronegative element? Yes. Okay. Or our, sorry, not an electronegative element, oxygen, nitrogen, or halogen. Yes, we do. So we do have hydrogen bonding in this case. Okay. Hydrogen bonding is an, a very important critical force. You move into biochemistry, that's ultimately what drives pretty much all biology is centered around uh, hydrogen bonding and its ability to either do it or not do it. Draw, draws a lot of protein foldings and how amino acids actually work. Okay. So how can we take advantage of knowing these forces? Okay. So that previous slide we put in all the definitions 
And now I've converted it in kind of a, a color wheel to show that delineation between our bonds and forces. As we increase the interaction between two atoms, okay, with our London dispersion, are those two atoms bound to each other? No, they're in separate molecules, and we're looking at how those two atoms are interacting. If we're looking at a London dispersion interaction, they aren't interacting much at all. If we can increase the interaction, say up to a dipole-dipole, we now get a stronger attractive force because we have those partial charges attracting to each other. We can increase it even further into that special category of hydrogen bonding. Right? We can increase it even further into an ionic uh, force. If we increase it even further, we start to push across into that bonding situation. If we continue to increase that attractive strength between those atoms, we can start to push all the way back down and around to our covalent bond being that strongest interaction between those two atoms. Okay? So the idea is to be able to manipulate and look at this to decide how our interactions work. Okay? And then to remember as well, it's not as that last slide showed. We don't have just these categories. What we're looking at is a complete color spectrum of all of these transitioning. Okay? The example I think I gave in lab but haven't given in lecture yet, take a look at the rainbow. Okay, within the rainbow, what colors are in the rainbow? Everybody comes up with Roy G. Bibb. Good. Okay, what about mauve? Yep. Burgundy? Yep. Those colors are present. Why did you not list any of those colors? Because we decided to arbitrarily put on the standard colors that we could see, and that's where we came up with Roy G. Bibb. We're doing the exact same thing with our bonds and forces. We are putting on arbitrary points where we can see enough of a difference to delineate it from the other forces, okay, or the other bonds. How can we use these? Okay, well, we can look at melting points, boiling points, solubility, vapor pressure. It plays a huge role in reactivity. Okay, well, how does that end up working? Well, what happens when we look at a melting point? Uh, go easier than that. In general, what happens when you melt something? We get a phase change from solid to liquid. Okay, what else changed in that process? Okay, we had to change the temperature, true. We can look at how the material changed its properties. If we take a look at a solid block, okay, we can say solid block. Okay? Can we ever say a liquid block? No, why not? When we look at the liquid, what does it do? It spreads and it moves around. Okay. Why is the solid staying in a block but the liquid not? Lattice structure contributes to its overall shape, but why does it hold that lattice structure? It's ultimately the forces within those individual molecules. If those forces are attract or those molecules are attracted to each other with a great force, it stays as a solid. What if it's a relatively weak force? Well, now it doesn't want to be a solid. It shifts up into a liquid, okay, or even a gas. Where is that energy coming from allowing us to shift between those? That's the temperature of our environment. Okay, so when we look and compare uh, two common compounds, let's say water and methane, what phase is water? Let's say H2O, actually. We're looking at a liquid typically at room temperature, in the phase of methane? Gas. Gas. Okay. Why? They both have roughly the exact same, or roughly the same weight. Why does all of a sudden our melting point change so drastically? Why do we see a different phase? Comes back to those intermolecular forces. Methane is CH4, which hopefully you can kind of see up on that screen. Whereas water, not CH4, right? So when we draw out and evaluate the structures, and we evaluate the individual bonds within these, methane has what type of bond? What type of bond? Our nonpolar covalent. So when I look at the interaction between individual methane molecules, the interaction I'm going to see is a London dispersion interaction. How strong is that? Not very strong at all. Very, very weak. 
If we shift to looking at water now, what's the bond within water? Polar covalent, which gives us what type of force? Dipole, dipole, good answer. If we have a dipole, dipole, what do we need to do? Check for hydrogen bonding. Does water give us hydrogen bonding? Yes. Now what we can do is look at our primary forces between these. Water has hydrogen bonding. Methane has London dispersion. Which one's the stronger force? Hydrogen bonding. The stronger force means what as far as the energy that needs to go into it? We need to put more energy in to break those two molecules away from each other. How do we put energy in? You increase the temperature. Right. So water is going to have a much higher melting point or boiling point relative to methane because it has a much stronger intermolecular force holding it together. Okay. So what you're looking at is manipulating those forces and trying to decide and ranking them what does that do for your overall probabilities or what that does for your overall shapes. What happens when we look at vapor pressure? What is vapor pressure? Okay. It's the natural tendency of our liquid to form a gas. So it's the pressure of the gas above the liquid. Okay. So what we're doing is naturally doing a phase change already. So what do you think would happen? If something has a high vapor pressure, what kind of force should that molecule have? It should have a very weak force because our liquid naturally wants to jump up into the gas state. So if we had a substance that we knew had a high vapor pressure, what could we guess about the, inter or sorry, not the intermolecular forces, the bond structure? We would expect purely covalent bonds. So a simple observation, experimental observation of that vapor pressure can now allow us to predict something about the structure. Okay? That's a pretty huge leap. It's actually really impressive to be able to put that together. What if we have a very small vapor pressure? Now we need a really strong force, which means we also need, don't say strong bond, we need a, a more polar bond. We're looking more at an ionic bond versus a covalent bond. Okay? Questions about that? Anybody not in the lab? Dang it. Okay. Solubility. Let's take a look at solubility. What's going to happen with solubility? Actually, let me change. I just realized I've got a lot of this up here. All right, if we take a look at our solubility, it's the ability of two things to mix. All right, and in particular, we're looking primarily at something mixing in a liquid and to get this homogeneous mixture. All right, for that to occur, what has to happen? Let's see. Whoops. Sorry, I thought I had it stepwise out so I could have some space. So if we kind of drew this with some shapes, we took some boxes. What phase do you think I just represented with those boxes? Why a solid? Relatively consistent, organized. Jeez, I can draw circles. Just go back to preschool. Thanks for the support on that, saying, no, no, I need to go back to preschool. We didn't agree with you. It's true. I guess that's true. Count the blessings. Now we got a liquid. For these two to actually mix and dissolve to form this homogeneous mixture, what has to happen? It's going to have to do with the intermolecular forces. If we take a look at the solid, what's keeping it a solid? The intermolecular forces holding those all together as a solid. When we go through and look at the even mixture, it really would have been nice if I'd given myself some more space, we need to have our circles and our squares all kind of scattered around each other. So in the process, we end up generating new forces. If we go through and compare this, the new forces we generated must be as equally strong or stronger than what we started with. Why? What we're trying to do is decide, can these two interact with each other? And they have to interact favorably. The reason we get strong interactions was because why? 
What was the issue with the polarity? We were trying to cancel charges to do what to the energy? No. Drop the energy. So if we're looking at a solid, we've kind of found a state where we've neutralized that as much as possible. If we're going to mix it with another species, we have to at least match that interaction. Otherwise, what's the solid going to do? Stay solid. It's going to stay a solid. There is no reason for it to interact or mix because it's already at a lower energy state. So for us to get that mixing to occur, we have to provide an, there has to be enough of an energy balance to account for that mixing process. Okay? Kind of a neat concept. So as a general rule of thumb, you usually hear that like dissolves like. What that statement is actually saying is like forces dissolve like forces. If we have a strong hydrogen bonding solvent like water, whatever we dissolve in it must also kind of counteract or account for that hydrogen bonding imbalance. We have to match that energy. So if we're going to dissolve something in water, that compound has to have hydrogen bonding forces. If it doesn't have those hydrogen bonding forces, water would prefer to interact with itself to maintain its lowest energy state, which means that other species doesn't mix with it. Okay? So it again comes back to these forces and how we can go through and predict and manipulate these. Okay? Questions about some of the repercussions of our forces or really ap application? Yeah. It actually probably does go with saturation. Uh, the typical ex explanation I would give you for saturation is that we can only put so many different things in there. But I think the reason we can only put so many different things in there is eventually we stop the interactions between water molecules and water goes to a much higher energy state and says this doesn't work, kick some of that stuff out. Okay. As far as the lab goes, very rarely do we ever reach that saturation state, for organic at least. Okay. So what is reactivity? Reactivity is now ultimately pushing these forces to the absolute extreme. Instead of just having two things mix like solubility, we're actually pushing these and saying, now I don't want that force because I can trade it out for a lower energy bond. Okay, so what we're doing is exchanging bonds now. Have you seen reactivity before? Have you ever done a chemical reaction? Yeah. yeah. What's the chemical reaction you see primarily in 151 and 152? Acids and bases. Any ideas why acids and bases? Easy. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy um, to actually run those reactions, easy to monitor them, because we can monitor via pH, okay? and they're easily reversible. So if you spill some, we can neutralize your spill relatively quickly and easily. Okay? So what we'd be looking at is our acids and bases. Well, what was an acid? Something that donated hydrogen. Uh, take a little bit further than that. Donates a positive hydrogen or a proton. We'll get to that. What was our base? Something that accepted a proton. For something to accept a proton, what charge does it need to be? Negative. Negative. What did we just generate? We now have a very strong attraction between a positive and a negative. We're looking ultimately at an ionic bond that now pushes to H2O. H2O, a polar covalent bond. All right, so our acid-base chemistry is ultimately taking that very strong attractive force and pushing it all the way into a bond. All right, so our acids and base definitions are really um, relatively easy to work with. Right, so we tend to talk about those the most, and like I said, they're easier to monitor, so very, very common. You get a variety of different acid-base definitions. The Arrhenius one, I'll start off right away and say I think it's an absolutely horrible definition, particularly as far as organic chemistry goes. Manageable in 152. Okay, why is it a horrible definition? What is the definition for an Arrhenius acid or base? Good, all your general chemistry instructors thought they were horrible too. The Arrhenius acid... H plus donor. An Arrhenius base? Nope. OH minus donor. Okay. 
that narrows the definition so much that we really can't do much other than just adds hydrogens and OH minus. Okay? So it's a pretty horrible definition as far as application. Bronsted and Lowry came through and said, let's switch that definition around a little bit, and it gets a little bit better. In that case, we end up looking at protons, also known as... Okay, we're looking at H plus or hydrogen ions. So if we're looking at the transfer of an H plus in the course of a reaction, we're looking at what species? <coughs> what species gives up an H plus? Our Bronsted-Lowry acids. What species would accept an H plus? A Bronsted-Lowry base. I already forgot how much I gave away there. So we'll typically refer to these as proton donors and proton acceptors. Okay, depending on your instructor, you may have seen the definition with Lewis. What's happening with our Lewis acids and bases? Okay. The problem with our Bronsted-Lowry definition is now when we run chemistry, the only thing that we can do is transfer a hydrogen ion. Are there situations where something more than a hydrogen ion changed its location? Yeah, in fact, most of organic chemistry involves something beyond a, a hydrogen ion. All right, well, what else was transferred in the process of transferring that hydrogen ion? Electrons. We also had to move electrons. We changed the bonding characteristics. Well, what makes a bond? Electrons. electrons. So Lewis came through and said, yeah, your definition works, but I can only apply it to those specific cases. I want a broader definition. So what he went through and said is, hey, you know what? Electrons always have to move. There is no choice. Every single reaction is going to involve the transfer of electrons. Okay? Or, sorry, the movement of electrons. Stick with that. So he went through and revamped these definitions to apply to the transfer of electrons. Okay? I typically think looking at the base, our Lewis base, is a little bit easier to manipulate. One of the other things that we want to be aware of is that once we've identified a species as an acid, okay, that should be a Bronsted-Lowry acid, possibly, and a Lewis acid. We don't want to go through and say oh, it's a Bronsted-Lowry acid, but then a Lewis base. Okay, that just confuses things. Okay, so let's take a look at our base definition. Okay, give me an example base for our Bronsted-Lowry situation. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. Typically see that as NaOH. The first thing we could simplify here, what type of bond do we have between sodium and hydroxide? It's an ionic bond, which means really we're looking at sodium ion and hydroxide ion. What can you tell me about sodium ion? It's a spectator. So I don't care. Let's get rid of it. So what we're looking at as our good Bronsted-Lowry base is actually hydroxide, OH minus. Right? In the course of it acting as a base, what does it do? Okay, it accepts the proton. So let's take a look at a good Bronsted-Lowry acid. Give me a good Bronsted-Lowry acid. HCl, thank you. It's usually a dangerous question. What type of bond do we get between hydrogen and chloride? Definitely on a threshold. You're looking at polar covalent almost actually pushes into ionic. Okay. So when we look at HCl, what happens when it hits water? Dissociates. Completely dissociates into the ions. So the better thing we could look at would be H plus and Cl minus. Which part of those are we concerned about when we look at our acids? The H plus. The H plus. So what can we do with our chloride? Well, it's a spectator in this case. If we look at a chemical reaction, what's our resulting product? H. Oops. Again, with the color coding, right? I know you love it. Where did that bond come from? What makes that bond? Electrons. Electrons. So if we look at this reaction in a standard general chemistry fashion, it's a little bit odd. We don't see exactly where those electrons have come from. But if we switch our view to the actual reactivity that we would look at with organic chemistry, what's the proper Lewis structure for hydroxide? No 
Now it's purple. Deal with that difference. Okay. What happened? What did hydroxide do? It donated a pair of electrons to that hydrogen ion. So mechanistically, if we wanted to show how this reaction occurred, we took the electrons on our OH- and we shared them with our H+. We moved a pair of electrons, so we used that double-headed arrow. The net result is we now have a bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay. So now let's tweak and come up with our Lewis definition. What did our Bronsted-Lowry base do with its electrons? donated its electrons. So a Lewis base is going to be an electron donor. What did our Bronsted-Lowry acid do in the course of this reaction? It accepted electrons. So our Lewis acid becomes an electron acceptor. So those of you saying it's the reverse, kind of, we do switch acceptor versus donor. Okay, but you have to be very careful with what you're switching when you go through and do that. I'd rather you pick something that you know. Hopefully everybody remembers HCl as a favorite acid. You'll probably hear me ask that question again. So come up with HCl, favorite base, sodium hydroxide. Once you've identified that what an acid looks like and what a base looks like, run the reaction. What physically occurred? Note how you're changing those structures, and you can define or come up with the definitions in each case without having to memorize more than you've already memorized. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. Lewis uh, acids and bases. Uh, for some reason, when we shift into organic chemistry, we don't like referencing them as Lewis acids and Lewis bases. So typically, we use a different definition different phrase. We're looking at electrophiles and nucleophiles. So let's break those names down. Electro sounds like electrons. File, like. So an electrophile is something that likes electrons. What charge would a species be that liked electrons? Positive. What charge was our H plus? Positive. Okay. So the word itself gives us clues about what we'd be looking at. What about nucleophile? What does nucleo sound like? Nucleus. nucleus. What charge is our nucleus? Positive. File? Like. So we've got something that is likes positives. What charge would something that likes positives need to be? Negative. What charge is our hydroxide? Negative. Negative. Okay. This little balance of positive and negative can really help out. Because when you look at a structure, can you identify the partially positive sites? How? By remembering your electronegativity balances. If you found a site that is partially positive, what does that mean it could potentially react as? Careful for it to act as an acid, and we'll come back with our definitions on this. For it to act as a Bronsted-Lowry acid, it's not just positive. It's positive and hydrogen. Okay. So it probably makes sense if we just know that it's positive to reference it as an electrophile. If we find something that's partially negative, what have we just found? Something that could potentially act as a nucleophile. Okay. So a lot of organic chemistry is going kind of this balance. Generate, look at the difference at your electronegativities, find your partial charges, and now classify them as electrophile or nucleophile. If you found a nucleophile, what do you think it's going to react with? An electrophile. So if you identify one, find the other. Put them together and hope it works. All right, for this semester, it works pretty darn well when we look at the reactivity. All right, I do want to change something real quickly here. Why did I step wise it? What the heck? What is going on? Okay. I want to be a little bit careful um, when we reference each of these. When I say acid, I'm referring very specifically to a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Okay. So that's me personally. Any ideas why I might do that? Become more apparent as the semester goes. 
kind of. No, I'd say it's the easiest. I'm lazy. I don't want to say Bronsted Lowry acid every time I'm talking about a Bronsted Lowry acid. Okay. So I'll just refer to it as an acid. When we look at our Lewis acids and bases, I'll refer to them as nucleophiles and electrophiles. Okay. That way I can keep the acid base definition to something we're all used to seeing and then really shift into just kind of this new definition of our Lewis, uh, which is ultimately our electrophile nucleophiles. That allows us to set up and quickly reference these things without having to make sure, double back, and say, well, actually, I meant Bronsted-Lowry acid. No, actually, I meant the Lewis base. Okay? So just be kind of aware of what I'm referencing when I talk about it. Uh, actually, I don't want to do that yet. So let's take a look. A couple structures. SO2, what do you think? Think it's an acid, or is it, or is it a Bronsted-Lowry or a Lewis? Okay. For sure, it cannot be Bronsted-Lowry acid, okay, because there's no hydrogen. Okay. As far as deciding if it's a Bronsted-Lowry base, what does it need to have? Negative charge, negative charge is a big tip-off, but negative charge ultimately means you have electrons. SO2 could have electron, uh, electrons. So it could potentially be a, a Bronsted-Lowry base. How would we decide? What's shown in that upper right-hand corner? You had to tell me what all of those were. No, just that box section. Those are all, no, SO2 is not an ion. Kind of compound. They're formulas. What did I say you should do with formulas? Draw them. So if you're given SO2, you should draw out the Lewis structure of SO2 and then evaluate it. Okay? What chemistry is possible to that structure? Because where the electrons are within the structure is going to drastically change what you could classify its reactivity as. Okay? So SO2, how do we start our Lewis structure? I don't want to hear S in the middle. It's not that that's wrong. It's not my first step. It's the first step. Count your valence electrons. How many valence electrons does sulfur have? Six. Oxygen. How many oxygens? What do we get? Now what can we say? We put our sulfur in the middle. That lone pair thing that you're talking about is what general chemistry textbooks say I'm going to step away from that. Okay. Sulfur is our least electronegative of those. We'll put that in our middle, and we can scatter our other atoms around. What's the next step? No drawing of bonds. It works in this case, but I want to tweak your definition. It's not, not around the non-center element. It's put the electrons around the most electronegative. In this case, you're right, but I want to get very specific with that. How many electrons should we put around our most electronegatives? Eight. Eight to satisfy our octets. Right? So I think I counted that, right? Our next step. Anywhere we have a pair of electrons between atoms, we can now turn it into a bond. Next step, check your octets. Do oxygen have, does each oxygen hold an octet? Yes. How about the sulfur? No. What do we have to do? We'll have to share electrons. Did I have to pick that pair of electrons? Nope, which means, oh man, left myself lots of space. Next step, check octets. Oxygen satisfied? Oxygens are okay. Sulfur satisfied? Now, next step, 
Formal charge. How do we calculate formal charge? Valence minus the number of bonds. Valence minus the number of bonds minus the number of non-bonding electrons. You should be able to go through and relatively quickly come up with a negative charge out on that oxygen. Okay. There should be a big tip-off that we aren't done. What's that big tip-off? What's the charge on the molecule if I leave it as is? Negative. What's the charge according to my formula? Zero, which means I must have missed something. So if we go back through and look carefully, what are we going to find? Sulfur can carry a positive charge. We could go through and do another double bond. Um, why would we go through and show another double bond? To eliminate the formal charge, but also sulfur can have more. We want to minimize formal charge. So this one is a bit tricky. We want to minimize the formal charge as much as possible. So we want to shift electron density in from our oxygens. Right? If we go through and do that, we end up with this structure, Hi. why does that look a bit weird? Oh, come on, yeah, draw it, sure. draw it, <laughs> do it, come on. It just disconnected, so give it a little bit. I'll draw it up here. I'm sure by the time I draw it, it's going to pop up, which I'm going to love. Thank you for letting me know it wasn't drawing. I thought you were just trying to surprise us. No, no, not really. Okay, there's our structure. In theory, it's still recording it properly, so I'll let that go. So this is what our structure looks like. Why does that look a little bit weird? There are 10 electrons around the sulfur. That's more than an octet. Can sulfur exceed its octet? Yes, so given the opportunity, we will exceed the octet. So at fast for the Lewis structure, what's your answer? This one. We don't show the other ones. Why do we not show the other ones? Charge. Okay, the other ones are charged. This one's overall neutral. Or not overall neutral. There's no formal charge on it. Okay, so this structure ends up being our best Lewis structure. As far as deciding the reactivity... Does the structure that's drawn up on the board help us? No. Okay, so what we could go back and do is look at our Lewis structures. Okay, or our first bad resonance structures. When we look at our first bad resonance structure, what do we see? See, more than partial charges, there are formal charges. We've got negatives and positives. So let's just let's see if I can simplify this. Delete everything? Okay, it's not going to delete everything. So let's just look at one. So what are you saying, Tui? So overall, they can cancel out like we drew up here. Okay. What we're trying to do is predict the reactivity now of SO2. So the reactivity, I don't care what the formal charge is. I want to determine how that molecule can interact. So for it to interact, what do we need to find? Charge. So if we look at a resonance structure, our first bad resonance structures, what did we find? Charge. How might we predict the molecule of SO2 to interact with other molecules? Take a stab at it first. See what you guys come up with. The oxygen might very well act as a Lewis base or a nucleophile. Why? Because it has the electron density to donate out. What else? The sulfur could act as a Lewis acid or our electrophile. Which one wins? Discussion for later in the class. We won't worry about that now. <laughs> what you're trying to do is identify those sorts of site, uh, sites of reactivity. Once you've got them labeled, now we can start to predict what they would interact with. Okay. Our oxygen not only can act as a Lewis base, but it could also act as can also act as a Bronsted-Lowry base. Okay. 
Bronsted Lowry base is just need to have electrons to share with hydrogen. We wouldn't be able to decide if it was acting as a Bronsted Lowry base until we saw the reaction. Right. So if I took SO2 and added it to an acidic solution, what did SO2 act as? Careful. Get better answer. It acted as a Bronsted Lowry base because it was in an acidic solution. We've identified the possible sites of reactivity. Now what we would do is look at our solution or what else are we mixing it with and see how it would then respond in that environment. In that environment, SO2 would have to act as a Bronsted Lowry base. Okay. So SO2 is an interesting one. Why is it interesting? Two sites of reactivity of opposite directions. Kind of tricky. Let's try an easier one. How about copper plus two? And that might be a, a, a bit difficult to draw out the Lewis structure for, but let's go through it real quickly. Sarcasm, that's it. How is copper plus two going to act in a reaction? It's going to have to accept electrons because it's positively charged. There's no hydrogen, so it can't be a Bronsted Lowry acid. It can't be a Bronsted Lowry base because it doesn't have electrons. So we're going to have to have it be Lewis. It needs to accept electrons. Which Lewis definition accepted electrons? The Lewis acid. We're looking at an electrophile. Okay. Kind of makes sense? You'll notice that in only chapter two, we've now not only just took our structure information and said, here's structure, now here's a new topic. It's, here's structure, now use structure to determine this new topic. Okay? It builds very, very quickly. Okay? You can't just forget that material. Nothing just disappears, like in general chemistry. We will constantly keep coming back to it. Okay? Questions? Okay. Let's make it more complicated. Yeah, might as well. All right. Take a look at these two reactions. Let's pick the top one. What changed? What was that? That hydrogen has exchanged positions. What type of reaction did we do here? We looked at the transfer of a hydrogen. So we're looking at a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction. Okay. So what? Go ahead. Can we subcategorize that? Subcategorize it as a Lewis acid base? Yes. Okay. Remember, if we're going to look at just the hydrogen transfer, we're going to stick with acid base. And according to my statements, if we're going to call it acid base, we're really referring to the Bronsted Lowry acid base. Okay. So we're trying to separate those two definitions as much as possible. Our Bronsted Lowry stick with hydrogens. Our Lewis acid base does pretty much everything else. Okay. And as we will find very quickly, say, in that next one, what type of reaction happened in the next one? What changed? Our halogen switched, also known as substitution. We substituted our halogens within this. We broke a carbon iodide bond, and we made a carbon chloride bond. How did this happen? What did our species act as in our reactant? Right. What's the definition of a Lewis acid? Our Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. Chloride is negatively charged. Can chloride possibly be a Lewis acid? No. What did it act as? acted as our Lewis base, also known as a nucleophile. For it to act as a nucleophile, that means this species had to act as 
an electrophile. What do we have to find within this structure? Positive charge. A positive charge. Do we see a positive charge? No. No. So if we don't find a formal charge, what should we look for? Dipoles. Dipoles. Let's look for a partial charge. Do we have a partial charge? Yeah. What type of bond was broken? Carbon iodide bond, which is known as which type of bond? A polar covalent bond, which means we've generated partial charges around that atom. Our iodide is partially negative. Our carbon is partially positive. So our species on the left, bleh, one of those words, acted as a Lewis acid or our electrophile. Can we push it a little bit further? The carbon, now being circled in orange, acted as an electrophile. Which is why when we go back to our definitions, okay, for polar covalent, or the definitions that I gave you for approximations, those approximations are really going to trump the actual differences in electronegativity. And that's because when we're looking at the reactivity of those, it's not just electronegativity. It also has to do with size. So iodide has this extra issue with it being polarizable because it's so big. Yeah. Which, again, later in the semester when we actually talk about this reaction. So what I want you to be able to do particularly by the end of the semester, is given any reaction. I don't care where it shows up, first semester, second semester. You should be able to tell me what species acted at the Lewis acid, Lewis base, Bronsted-Lowry acid, Bronsted-Lowry base. Why? Because you know the definitions. The definitions for your acids and bases and your nucleophiles and electrophiles are ridiculously important. If you can look at a structure and identify one of those species, you now have a vastly easier job as far as predicting what you need to do with it. Okay? And I guarantee I'll throw curveballs at you as far as the exam goes with this. You'll see some simple examples and you'll see some more difficult ones where massive amounts of things change, but you should be able to predict ultimately what beginning and end, identify what changed, define those species, where those parts came from. Okay? It's tricky. It's also fun, eventually. Okay. More questions on this? Okay. So let's do some quick Bronsted-Lowry practice. Uh, I really don't want to end on this slide, but it would probably take you a couple minutes to go through and do this. So pick one or two of these. See what you can come up with as far as the reaction when you react each of these with water. All right, if you've got questions about predicting these reactions, please raise your hand. I'll come to you and work through one with you. Uh, if you think you got it, go through and crunch through a couple of them just to see what the result is. Let's pick number four. Whoa, come back here. Sorry, on my screen that looked a lot more dramatic. Yeah, not so much for you. It's okay. So let's take number four. We're going to react it with water. So we're just going to add water. We're going to run the reaction and see what happens. This one's a little bit trickier than, say, the first one. We'd have to decide what is our species going to act as. Water's tricky because it can act as both an acid and a base. So let's take a look at our other molecule here. First thing that we would do, or first thing I would do, cross out the sodium. Why? Spectator ion. Okay. It's a spectator ion with what charge? Positive, which means the part that's left has what charge? Negative. negative. What species are negative? Uh, bases. bases. What does a base need to do? Except a hydrogen ion. All right. Remember, we're looking at Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases. So I would write out that new formula, or that old formula, C2H3O2. But now, in the course of the reaction, I need to put on a hydrogen. Where do I put that hydrogen? Okay, all sorts of different answers you could give with this. Ultimately, why I hate formulas. We should look at the structure. What you guys should be used to is seeing that hydrogen in front. If it's an acid, you see the hydrogen in front. That's gen chem. It's never going to happen again. Okay. What's the other result? 
That means water had to act as an acid. Acids lose hydrogen or donate hydrogens. So if I look at my product, I'm going to have to be HO. I got rid of one of those hydrogens. But the hydrogen was lost as H+, plus, which means HO needs to be negative. negative. Yes, that looks a bit odd. So maybe we would end up typically writing that as OH-. minus. Either way, you get the exact same answer. And one of the things that you'll find in organic chemistry is there is no left, right, up, or down. So we can draw it any way we want. Okay? So hopefully you're OK predicting those acid-base reactions and going through those. Some of them are easier than others. Like that last one's a bit tricky. Okay, why is that last one tricky? Oh, because they're both spectators. Sodium is typically a spectator. So that would mean chloride's acting as our base. If chloride acts as a base and accepts a hydrogen, what do we make? Hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is strong acid, which means it immediately goes backwards. Okay, so that's definitely a trickier one. This is from an equilibrium lecture. So let's make it a little more challenging. I'll end it on this one. So you can go through and take a look at these two structures and identify the acidic hydrogen in each structure and then compare the two structures to each other and identify which hydrogen is the most acidic between these two compounds. All right? We are officially done, so if you've got questions... Uh...